It is uh, therefore time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. I want to read you some lines from economic expert Ben Eisen's recent op-ed on the provincial budget. I'll, I'll, I quote, over the past three years, Ontario's net debt has increased by $34.8 billion. Over the next three years, the province expects to add $34 billion in, in debt, almost exactly wow. the same wow. amount. Wow. In this context, the government's rhetoric that a balanced operating budget has donned a new fiscal day and the province can now offend, uh, afford to sp spend freely rings hollow. So instead of a new fiscal day, what we have is more being spent on interest payments, $10 billion more in debt this year, and the crowding out of frontline services. So, Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Finance Question. tell this legislature what did he have to cut to pay for these higher interest payments in the debt? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question from the member opposite, who, by the way, voted in the largest deficit in our country's history of $55 billion. Is this is the same yeah. member who, by the way, had accumulated deficits throughout their time, more than double Canada's overall debt, and never once, Mr. Speaker, did they ever pay down debt. Furthermore, Interest on debt, which he refers to now, today, in Ontario, is the lowest it's ever been, especially when compared to the Conservatives at 16 per cent. Today, it's 8.4 per cent of our overall budget, and, Mr. Speaker, it's locked in for 30 and 40 years on many respects. So going forward, we are addressing debt, and the first, the first way to address debt, Mr. Speaker, is to balance the books, and we're balancing the books this year, next year, and the year after. And, Mr. Speaker, we're investing, we're yes, investing heavily on a number of programs and services for the people of Ontario. I ask that member, what will he cut going forward? Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Finance, and you'll notice he did not answer the question about the skyrocketing debt in Ontario. He chooses to attack rather than to defend a budget that is struggling in debt. Those shell games Ontarians can see through. And the reality is when they're adding so much debt, it means there's no ability to help. And a good example of that is the City of Toronto. The conclusion from the City Manager of Toronto, Peter Wallace, and his words were, there are no new investments to, for Toronto. So despite the Liberals telling Mayor Tory they were going to invest in the City of Toronto, Toronto is receiving nothing from this government. So, Mr. Speaker, will the minister come clean? Are the Liberals attacking us? We've had two exchanges, and both sides are interrupting their own questioner and their own answer, and we're going back and forth. So, I'm, I'm more than willing to jump into warnings, and your next little foray will dictate whether I will or I won't. Finish your question, please. So, Mr. Speaker, are the Liberals simply attacking Mayor Tory because they're embarrassed of their own budget, budget which is suffocating in high Question. debt and does nothing for the city of Toronto? So, Mr. Speaker, I'll answer the first part of the question. We're investing $11.5 billion more in health care. We're investing another $6.5 billion more in education, and we're making record investments in infrastructure and transit for the people of Ontario, all of which, in good part, is going to be supported by increased debt to the extent of those capital improvements and capital investments. What will he cut as we move forward on those very issues that are important to the people of Ontario? member from Nipissing will come to order, and I believe that one might be close enough for me to go to warnings. We'll check. Finish, please. And Mr. Speaker, we are investing in Toronto, heavily in fact. Toronto will set its priorities. We said we will match and support ongoing investments in social housing as well Answer. as in infrastructure. The member opposite has opposed a revenue request. The member opposite has not even agreed to Toronto's issues we have. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Finance, uh, and for a third time, for a second time, the Minister of Finance refuses to acknowledge that we have $34 billion in new debt over the next three years. Debt is still skyrocketing in Ontario. And 
what it means we have so much debt and so much interest payments, no ability to invest. And, and, and frankly, despite what the Minister of Finance says, when the mayor and the entire city council are saying this government does nothing for Toronto, it speaks loudly. And the reality is they have made choices. You know, they, an example of the lack of support for Toronto, the Liberals cut $1.4 million from the Toronto Public Library. Where is this government's priorities? How can this minister justify a billion dollars to pay for their gas plant scandal, but $1.4 million for Question. the library in Toronto is too much? It's not right, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. Here, Mr. So here are the priorities of this budget. Pharmacare, free for every child under 25, Mr. Speaker. Tuition for our children, 210,000 going to school this year, free for them as well, Mr. Speaker. We're continuing to provide for junior kindergarten, and we're making investments and working with businesses to provide for more economic growth. What will he cut? Will he cut pharmacare going forward? Will he cut free tuition for our students? Will he cut the supports we're making for business? And Mr. Speaker, we are the largest contributor to the city of Toronto by far, and he has never once supported their initiative, for that matter, any municipality in Ontario, because they downloaded and we're uploading, Mr. Speaker. You see it, please? You see it, please? Start the clock. Good question, Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. I was pretty optimistic when I heard the Liberals might finally do the right thing and support our hospitals. But according to the Ontario Health Coalition, the Liberals' budget, to quote them, barely made a dent. They said the funding will hardly even cover inflation, and it certainly won't be enough to sustain the current system. That's from the Ontario Health Coalition. It seems it was just enough to get a few liberal-friendly quotes. Mr. Speaker, after years of freezing budgets and cutting health care and hospitals left, right and centre, will the minister admit this money doesn't cut it? They're not actually meeting the needs of Ontario's hospitals. Minister of Health Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I honestly don't know where to begin. I don't know if I should be talking about the two dozen hospitals that they closed when they were last in power, or I don't know if I should talk about when the leader of the, of the official opposition, when he was part of a government in Ottawa that ended the health services provided to refugees in this country, Mr. Speaker. There are so many examples. There are promise to cut 100,000 jobs, many of them in health care, but I am going to choose to talk about our investments. I'm giving you what you want. We're going to warnings. And I'll immediately use them. Finish, please. But I choose to talk about our investments as articulated by the Minister of Finance in our budget. Ms. Member from Leeds Grenville is warned. An additional nine answer. Nine billion dollars to construct new hospitals in this province, making a total of twenty billion dollars over the next. The member from Niagara West, my book is warned. New question or supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Health, there is a trend here. When the government can't defend their own record, they point fingers, they blame others, they blame past provincial governments, past federal governments. Defend your own record. Be proud of your own record. If, if you're actually not embarrassed by what you're doing for the Stop the clock. The member from Be Beaches East York is warned. And if you'd like, I'll move to, to naming. We're getting through this properly. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, if you can be proud of your record, you don't need to attack others. Let me give you another example. Jamie Lee Ball spent five days on a stretcher in a hallway, and this is what she had to say about this government's budget. When you explain it's just inflation, it's really just shocking to me. I don't understand how that's even negotiable. To offer Canadians their basic rights in regards to health care shouldn't be something they even have to discuss. Jamie Lee Ball is right. When, the, when, when this government, when this Liberal government has cut and cut health care for the last five years and you have patients being stuck on stretchers for five days, always, it's not right. So 
I'm asking Jamie LeBall's question. You didn't do enough for her. You didn't do enough for her. You haven't done enough for patients. When can we expect the Thank government you. to do the right thing? You see it, please. You see it, please. Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, on this side, we're proud of our record. The member opposite should be embarrassed at his own record, Mr. Speaker. When he was a part of government in Ottawa, they closed the Health Council of Canada. When he was part of a government in Canada, in Ottawa, they voted against the Refugee Interim Federal Health Program. They closed the National Aboriginal Health Organization. I can't imagine what the member opposite has in plan for the health care system, cutting and slashing. We're investing, Mr. Speaker. Seven billion dollars over the next three years to further reduce wait times. Wait times that are the best in the country, Mr. Speaker. Provide better access to care and to further enhance the patient experience. A 3.3 percent increase in health spending over the medium term, Mr. Speaker. A 3 percent increase to our Answer. hospitals' operating budgets. A more than 500 million dollar infusion on top of last year's 500 million dollars for a billion dollars for hospitals. No supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Health, and once again, typical response, they attack others. They can't be proud of the record. Why would they be proud of Jamie Lee Ball? Five Start the clock. The member from Etobicoke North is warned. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, they shouldn't be proud of the record. Jamie Lee Ball, five days on a stretcher in a hallway, and they're proud with what they're doing to health care? It's awful, Mr. Speaker. And according to the last Auditor General's report, just 30 per cent of patients observed in hospital ERs made it to an acute care ward in less than eight hours. They're proud of that eight hours as the Ministry of Health's own target? What was that? You know, maybe because Ontario has the fewest number of hospital beds per 1,000 people across the country that they accept this. Question. It's not good enough. The people of Ontario are patients, are sick, they deserve better. This government has not delivered. When will they support our Thank patients? You. Yeah. Yes, well, Mr. The member opposite is just making it up as he goes along. Because you can make it up. But the Fraser, the Fraser report, Mr. Speaker, says that 85 per cent of ER patients are getting treatment within the eight-hour target for complex patients and 89 per cent within the four-hour target for minor patients. In fact, ER wait times for the sickest patients have been cut by almost 30 per cent, while at the same time the volumes that we're seeing in our ERs have increased by 40 per cent, Mr. Speaker. More patients being seen, shorter wait times, to the point where also CAIHI, the Canadian Institute for Health Information, is further proof that our government has made great progress. Hip replacements, 85 per cent completed within the medical benchmark, higher than the national average. Knee replacement, higher than the national average. 99 per cent of radiation therapy within the medical benchmark, Mr. Speaker, also above the national average. Every single metric, we are near, if not at the top, of the national performance in wait times, Mr. Thank Speaker. The member from Nepean Carlton is warned. New question. The member from Temiskamee Cochrane. My question is to the Acting Premier. Can the Acting Premier tell the 2.2 million Ontarians with no drug coverage why the Liberals are refusing to, inter to introduce a universal pharmacare program and ensure their access to the medications they need? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And you know, I, I don't really understand why the third party wants to get into a squabble about whether their plan is better than our plan or our plan is better than their plan. We agree the time has come for pharmacare in Ontario and in Canada, Speaker. One significant difference between their plan and our plan is that ours will start in January this year or 2018 speaker everyone under age 25 with a health care with an ohip card will have access to free drugs with no co-pay speaker with no annual deductible we are very proud of the investment that we're making in pharmacare and we invite the ndp to join with us and support pharmacare in the province of ontario and beyond thank you supplementary 
The difference is what we're proposing is actually Pharmacare, and here's an example. Crazy from Newmarket saw the NDP Pharmacare announcement TV and called us to tell us her story on what Pharmacare would mean to her. She spent two years without benefits, first taking care of an ill relative and then working part-time without benefits. She has diabetes and high cholesterol. Her prescriptions cost $300 per month. Paying for these medications put her into credit card debt, and she's still struggling to pay that off. Tracy is older than 24. Our universal pharma plan, Pharmacare plan would cover Tracy. Why are the Liberals refusing to bring, to bring in a universal Pharmacare plan, leaving people like Tracy going into debt just to pay for the medication they need? Thank you. Mr. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I know the leader of the third party will be in Peterborough later today. And I hope while she's there, Mr. Speaker, and I know she's planning to talk about access to medications, I hope that when she's speaking to the crowd and the media, that she'll be telling them of in Peterborough alone of the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs is warned. Finish, please. I hope the leader of the third party will be telling the citizens of the great city of Peterborough that 34,000 children and youth that will, as of January 1st, be receiving full, free pharmacare, or how 11,500 households in Peterborough with children, Mr. Speaker. Those parents will no longer have to worry about paying for asthma inhalers or antibiotics Answer. or insulin. And Mr. Speaker, this begins at the start of next January. Member from Windsor West is warned. Final supplementary. New Democrats have a universal pharma care plan that will give drug coverage to 14 million Ontarians. Under this plan, no diabetic or HIV patient will celebrate their 25th birthday knowing they have lost the clock. <laughs> Minister of Infrastructure is warned. And I'm about maybe three questions away from naming. If you want that, you're going to get it. Finish your question, please. Under this plan, people with asthma or high blood pressure receiving social assistance can enter the workforce knowing they won't lose their drug coverage. Why is this Liberal government leaving millions of Ontarians without drug coverage by refusing to bring in a universal pharmacare plan for people above 24? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I think the member opposite knows that we have a program involving uh, Ontario Disability Supports as well as Ontario Works that, and Trillium programs that provide support to the uh, kinds of individuals that he is speaking to. However, under their plan, no one in this province will be covered for cancer medications. Under their plan, no one in the province yeah, will be covered for drugs for rare diseases. And I have to say that the leader of the third party, who was first them. elected 4,700 days ago and prior to last week, only mentioned in this legislature the word pharmacare three times. Once, in fact, she referenced it in the context of an op-ed that I had written about pharmacare. The other time she referenced it with regards to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, erroneously referring to the concern about pharmacare. Mr. Speaker, she had 4,700 days to talk about pharmacare. I appreciate the fact, late to the game, Mr. Yes, Speaker, but their advocacy is important as we try to secure pharmacare nationally. Thank you. Yeah. Your question, the member from Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Acting Premier. Does the Liberal government think it's okay that as a result of the Premier's cut in underfunding to our hospital, people are going to the emergency, in an emergency, are being treated in hallways, in a shower room, in a broom closet, or in a TV room for days and sometimes weeks on end? Mr. Premier. Mr. Of Health and Long -term Care. Mr. Of Health, Long-Term Care. 
Of course not, Mr. Speaker. It's not acceptable, and that's why last year and again this year we've made significant investments in our hospitals, both on the capital side, as for example the recent announcement at Trillium in Mississauga last week, where we announced that we are moving forward with the construction of a new hospital tower with acute beds, a new ER, as well as at the other sites of Trillium, Mr. Speaker, but also importantly on the operating side of, in terms of operating budgets immediately moving to add to the resources provided last year an additional 3% increase to operating budgets of hospitals across this province. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, that includes specific funds which will enable, in a flexible way, hospitals to address the unique challenges that they may be facing, whether that's in their ERs because of growth, the 40% increase of patients that are being seen in our ERs that Answer. I referenced earlier, or whether it's with regards to bed capacity and other issues. We're there to support our hospitals. Mr. Thank you. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Olive is 84 years old. She lives in Sudbury. She was admitted to the hospital with sepsis. While she was being treated, she spent her first two nights on a stretcher in a busy ER. The next 20 days in the TV room, including one night in the shower room that was quieter than the very busy TV room that she was in. The premier cut caused this crisis to happen, and her budget is not going to come close to fixing it. When is the Liberal government going to admit to the severity of the hospital overcrowding that the premier has created and stop pretending that a 2 percent increase is going to That's solve it? Speaker, I mean, first of all, the member's wrong uh, with her percentage. The increase in operating budgets uh, to our hospitals is 3 uh, percent. And, Mr. S Mr. Speaker, that includes, that includes a significant amount of funding specifically to priority services. It includes over a billion dollars invested over the next three years specifically to improve wait times, whether that occur in our ERs, whether it's the 2,800 more hip and knee replacements uh, that will be provided, whether it's the 29,000 more MRI hours, the 2,100 more cataract surgeries, whether it's $70 million to adopt the latest digital technologies, Mr. Speaker, $74 million for mental health services, $357 million for priority services in hospitals, $66 Sir? million for telemedicine. Altogether, including the increases already locked in from last year, $11 billion Thank more dollars into health care over the next three years. Thank you, Speaker. Well, Speaker, people across Ontario go to the hospital and they end up being treated in hallways. That's because for a decade, hospital budgets have been cut or frozen. We're talking about years and years of this Liberal government doing damage to our hospital, and the Premier isn't undoing this damage. Instead, our hospital budget falls at least $300 million short of what is needed to keep the crisis from getting worse, not even to get things better. Why is the Liberal government refusing to take responsibility for the damage the Premier has done to our health care system and to make a real and meaningful commitment to ending hallway medicines in Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, let's, uh, let's hear what are those who truly know. Uh, uh, about uh, the, the, how meaningful the investments in last week's budget are. Uh, Theresa Agnew, Nurse Practitioners Association of Ontario. Today's provincial budget provides great news for the people of Ontario. With significant funding increases to hospitals, long-term care homes and primary care, we can better meet the needs of an aging population. NPAO is thrilled to hear about free prescription drugs for children and youth. Or Anthony Dale, President and CEO of the Ontario Hospital Association. It signals a renewed commitment from government to expand and enhance access to care across the continuum. The government's significant investments in hospital capital will help support a sustainable health care system Answer. for the future. Council of Academic Hospitals, the same thing, championing and celebrating the investments that we announced Thank last you. week, Mr. Speaker. Your question, the member from Nicholson. 
Thank you and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Finance Minister. We've been asking uh, you questions about Home Capital, the troubled mortgage lender, uh, also under Security Commission investigation. Depositors left and the share price tumbled. Then they received a $2 billion bailout from the Health Care of Ontario Pension Plan, or HOOP. Kevin Smith, the board chair of Home Capital, was a member of HOOP's board, and Jim Cohane, HOOP CEO, was also on the board of Home Capital. So after the $2 billion deal was done, they then resigned from each other's boards within 24 hours. All this happened right under the minister's nose. We want answers from the minister. Is an investigation into this perceived conflict of interest underway, or does the minister agree that what went down in that 24-hour period somehow passes the smell test? Question. Thank you, Minister Finance. Yeah, I appreciate the question, Mr. Speaker. In fact, as I replied already on occasion, investigations are underway. The Ontario Security Commission is doing its job uh, and, and has already made public as to some of the allegations being put forward. Um, OSFI, which is the federal regulator who oversees home capital, is also taking the appropriate steps to protect the interests of consumers and investors. And FISCO, which is a regulator for here in Ontario, has already performed and laid some of the charges regarding regards to fraud. So the member opposite is now making allegations allegations in regards to some of the executives and the chair ownerships and the chair as well as the trustees and the resignations. We get all that, but our primary concern is to ensure consumers and investors are protected and that we take the appropriate steps through the regulators, which is in fact they're Answer. doing their job to that extent. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You, supplementary. To the Minister, Kevin Smith is also the $720,000 a year CEO of St. Joseph Health Centre in Hamilton. But while he's at his $357,000 a year job at Home Capital, here's what's happening back at his hospital. 600 cataract surgeries stopped, 58 registered nursing jobs cut, mental health treatment unit closed, 136 more positions cut, including 61 RNs. Wow. And where was Kevin Smith through all this? Not in Hamilton, but in Toronto, attending 31 board meetings, earning a million and a half in stock. You have to ask, how could he possibly run St. Joseph's while heading up a multi-billion dollar company? I asked the minister, is it right that a hospital CEO who should be focused on health care have another full-time job where he earned over a million and a half dollars? Thank you. Minister Farnett. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, again, We've made investments in the hospitals. We're investing more in operating and in capital and supporting uh, the well-being of Ontarians as we proceed forward on those matters. And the member, the member from Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry, is warned. They have fiduciary duties, Mr. Speaker. In fact, uh, the Home Capital, as well as Hoop, act independently of government, and they take the decisions as they see appropriate. We, through the Ontario Securities Commission, as Fisco, make sure that they are operating to the extent that they protect consumers and investors, including the members and, and the beneficiaries of the pension plan. So it's, uh, their, it's their discretion, Mr. Speaker. They don't report to the government. They're separate of government. Yes, but we will take the appropriate steps to ensure that they're protected, and the member opposite has very clear stated that they have resigned now as directors and as chair of their respective operations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. New question, the member from Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Yesterday, the Liberals defended cutting 20 per cent from Toronto public libraries. The government says the library's digital archives project isn't being used. Actually, the fact is, Mr. Speaker, usage is up. The government said the library isn't spending the money. Actually, Mr. Speaker, the library says exactly the opposite is true. The Toronto Public Library says these liberal cuts will mean less service at Toronto libraries. Why is the Liberal government cutting from Toronto libraries, and what library services do they actually expect to disappear? Thank you. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. I want to be very, very clear on this. There is no change whatsoever to the base funding for Toronto Public Libraries. We continue to invest $4.1 million in annual base funding 
to Toronto Public Libraries. On top of that, there's an additional $1 million uh, to Toronto through the Ontario Library Capacities Fund over the last three years to support the important work they do. What has changed, Speaker, is funding for the Virtual Reference Library, a, a funding, by the way, that is 20 per cent provincial and 80 per cent City of Toronto, the Toronto Public Libraries. Speaker, we did contribute 20 per cent. We have seen a reduction of use. In the, we have chosen to reallocate that money in improving Answer. digital services, support leadership and innovation, and invest in rural and remote communities. Thank you. Here you are. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, back to the Acting Premier. Only in a Liberal world is a cut of 1.4 million not a cut. Um, <laughs> One, one of the great things, Mr. Speaker, about public libraries is everyone uses them. Young people use them, seniors use them, new Canadians use them. They are where people go to take out a book, use the internet, learn, take a language class, polish up a resume, catch up with friends and neighbours. Public libraries are at the heart of local communities, and the Liberals are making cuts to the Toronto Public Library. Just ask them. Simple question. Will the Liberals reverse their cuts to libraries in Toronto? Can we tell Toronto Public Libraries some good news? Okay. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you, Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for her question. You know, Speaker, I know that she shares the love and care and concern of libraries, and that's why I'm happy to share with her the following. Our public libraries remain an important priority for this government. That's why, Speaker, we actually take the time to talk to them and to listen to what they want. Uh, libraries across this province told us very carefully through the development of our culture strategy that they wanted to be sure that the dollars that we were investing made sense. This is funding for a program that's been in existence for 20 years that back then was an innovation, but over time, because of the increased development of the internet, has made it such that only 25 per cent of libraries in Ontario are using this program, and it's administered by the Toronto Public Library. It is not their core funding. It is not their base funding, which remains robust at 4.1 million dollars yes, and that's why mr speaker i want the opposite opposition to get their facts straight thank you, thank you. Yeah. no question the member from eglinton lords thank you, mr speaker as a member of the standing committee we're dealing with the safer school zones act it's a piece of legislation which came as a result of the, the minister of transportation yeah it came as a result of the fact is that we had a young six-year-old girl in Leaside killed on her way home from school. Last month, we had another seven-year-old boy killed outside of uh, Moorish uh, Public School. So we've got this bill before us that came as a result of this outcry from parents to make our school area safer. And what is really disgusting is that as we sit in committee, not only Liberals, but also the member from Niagara Falls would tell us that the members of the Conservative opposition have been directed by their leader to block, obstruct, hey. and filibuster this bill. They, the bill is only eight pages long. They've Thank introduced you. over three. Oh my God. Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Of course, I want to begin by thanking the member from Eglinton Lawrence for his advocacy on this issue and for hitting the nail right on the head, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, uh, last November I was delighted to join with Premier Kathleen Wynne and others, including Mayor John Tory, here from the City of Toronto in Leaside to announce the strong action that our government is taking to help make Ontario's community safer. In direct response to many requests that we have received from municipal partners across the province, including from Mayor Tory right here in Toronto, Speaker. We introduced Bill 65, the Safer School Zones Act. This bill contains strong tools to protect particularly children and seniors in our community, Speaker, because we want to make it safer 
for our most vulnerable road users. Speaker, as the member from Eglinton Lawrence pointed out, notwithstanding our best efforts to respond to the challenge that exists, the Conservative Party, under direction from their leader, Sir. have introduced over 300 amendments wow. to slow down passage wow. of this critical legislation. Yeah. Speaker, yeah. it is disgusting. It's unconscionable. Thank you. And I call on those members to help us move forward. Thank you. We are on warnings. Supplementary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you know what? It was even more appalling as we sat in that committee. We had listened to the principal of Allenby School in my riding at Avenue Road. There were two teachers critically injured in front of that school a couple of years ago. Both had to retire from teaching because of their injuries. She came and pleaded to the committee to proceed with the Safer School Zones Act to protect her teachers and students. Yet, you know one of the amendments they moved? The Conservatives, directed by their leader, said, do not allow any kind of uh, speed enforcement devices on Avenue Road. After the principal came and said we need something done on Avenue Road in front of Allenby School. How is that Order. responsible? When you have teachers, you Answer have parents pleading for something to be done about the speeding around our schools and in our communities. How can Thank they you. in conscience block? Thank you. You see it, please. You see it, please. The minister. The Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation will withdraw, and you are now warned. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I, again, I want to thank the member from Eglinton Lawrence for the follow-up question. You can understand, for those of us on this side, the government side of the House, and, and frankly, Speaker, including for members of the NDP caucus, this is a very serious piece of legislation yes. in communities right across Ontario. Toronto, Ottawa, York Region, and many others, uh, there has been a significant push from our municipal partners and our road safety partners to move forward with this legislation. Speaker, It is completely beyond my comprehension as to why the member from Kitchener-Conestoga and the leader of the Conservative Caucus would want to slow down passage of legislation that is designed specifically to help the elderly and to help students and their families get from point A to point B safely on the streets of the province of Ontario. Speaker, They have a chance at the committee stage to work with us to pass this legislation to do so in an expedited fashion Answer. so that we can continue to deliver road safety for the people of Ontario. It's truly what our youngest and our oldest deserve from their government. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question, the member from Chatham, Kent, Essex. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Speaker. Speaking of keeping children safe, my question is to the acting premier. Each day, thousands of students are put in harm's way as drivers blow by school buses that are stopped with their red and yellow lights flashing. It's not funny. Several municipalities have started pilot programs using stop arm cameras to capture evidence of these blow bys, and we need to update our laws to reflect that. In Mississauga, the pilot program discovered that each bus experienced two and a half blow bys per day. Mississauga Mayor Crombie knows the importance of protecting students and has called on this Liberal government to support my amendment to the Highway Traffic Act. In a statement, she said, We cannot wait for serious injury or fatality before we act. No parent or guardian should ever have to think about the safety of their child getting to and from school Shin. each day. Speaker, to the Acting Premier. Will this government listen to the pilot results here, here. and support our amendment to Bill 65, right. the Safer yeah. School Good Zones idea. Act? Good idea. The Minister of Transportation. Transportation. Well, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Speaker. I think it's fairly evident from not only the legislation that we've introduced with, with Bill 65, frankly, also my responses to the member from Eglinton Lawrence. We are a government that takes the safety of our most vulnerable road users extremely safely. Member from uh, Prince Edward Hastings is uh, one. Finish, please. Thank you, Speaker. So we take we take our responsibility uh, responsibility in this regard extremely uh, ex extremely seriously, Speaker. So of course we will always consider any initiative, uh, any move to help improve the safety of those vulnerable road users, Speaker. 
But fundamentally, the more than 300 amendments that that caucus has brought forward regarding Bill 65 have less to do with that particular initiative and far more Answer. to do with misguided principles on their part, Speaker, because they should be working closely with us to pass this legislation to help Thank the you. road users that they claim to be concerned about. Thank you very much. Supplementary, the member from Kitchener, Conestoga. It'll be exactly this initiative that we're talking about exactly. at 4 p.m. Speaker, this is about the safety of our children. It's about using our amendment to Bill 65 to take a significant step towards enhancing student safety. Exactly. At committee, Liberal members have already refused serious safety enhancing amendments to Bill 65. Please finish. They've already refused serious safety amendments at 265, like doubling school zone fines or implementing exactly. speed signs. If Premier Kathleen Wynne and her minister truly cares about student safety, she would allow her members to endorse this important safety measure for school bus cameras. True. This afternoon, 4 p.m., her members will have an opportunity, a simple choice to stand in support of Question. enhanced student safety or stand against it. Will the acting premier tell us now which will they do? Will they support our amendment to ensure student safety, Thank you. or will they not? Which one? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Thanks, Mr. Speaker, I said in my initial answer to the to the question from uh, his colleague that, of course, we will consider any initiative that actually will achieve the outcome that we're talking about here, Speaker. But again, fundamentally, over the last number of days on Bill 65, as it's been at committee, as that caucus and that member have brought forward. Member from Kitchener, Conestoga is warned. I'm not giving up. Thank you, Speaker. As that member and his caucus have brought forward, at the direction of their leader, Patrick Brown, so many amendments to slow down this process and filibuster Shame. this legislation. Shame. This latest stunt on their part, Speaker, speaks to me as something designed to save face because, rightly so, Speaker, they're embarrassed by their behavior as it relates to not standing up for students, not standing up for the most vulnerable. It's not going to work. We won't be fooled. Help us pass Bill 65. You see it, please. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, to the Acting Premier. The cost of a house is still skyrocketing. The budget doesn't have a single mechanism to help people buy a home. Instead, people saw a budget that tried to score cheap political points by talking about foreign speculators. But as long as you have a Canadian passport, or a Canadian business number, there's nothing to rein in speculation, nothing to stop consortiums from buying swaths of housing to drive up prices. Why are the Liberals helping speculators? Why are they letting housing prices rise so fast because of the action of those speculators? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Finance. Yeah. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. Seriously, I mean, there's a 16-point uh, uh, plan that we brought forward uh, to deal with both supply and demand with regards to housing, with an effort to uh, ensure that we cool the market, provide some greater stability. We brought in measures to protect uh, tenants uh, and renters. And, Mr. Speaker, um, we've taken, I mean, the NRIST, the non resident Canadian speculative tax, is only one component of that. We are still going after. Uh, those that are scalping uh, assignments of purchase on new developments, that's also being addressed. And Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to take the necessary steps going forward to have full disclosure, provide greater data and greater integrity in the work that we do to temper the market and protect the interests of homeowners as well as those new families trying to get into the market as well. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, again, to the Acting Premier, over the last year, the cost of a home in Toronto rose by 31.7%. It means the average home costs $920,791. A home at half that cost would still be out of reach for a lot of people. This budget protects corporations flipping properties and lets housing get even more out of reach for people. Why isn't the government dealing with speculation? Thank you, Minister. Uh, 
Mr. Speaker, we are dealing with speculation. That's the whole purpose of the of the 16-point plan and the and the housing affordability measures that we've taken. And as I said, we are going after those speculators that are crowding out families that want to buy into the marketplace. We're going after those that are taking advantage of loopholes and closing them. Working very closely with the federal government, the CRA, to ensure enforcement of those. And we're going after anyone that wants to speculate in a residential property at the expense of homeowners and new families trying to get into the marketplace. Now, part of the issue is the fact that Ontario is a destination of, uh, of choice. I mean, the region and the economy is growing. Uh, there's a lot of stimulus, a lot of new jobs coming to the province. It's attracting many more who want to choose to live in Ontario and in this region, and that's creating huge demand for our homes. Yes, we'll continue to support our marketplace, support our economic growth, and support those families with the measures that we take. Thank you. Thank you. The question, the, the member from Ottawa, Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Minister of Social Services, Services and Community Service. Service Ontario Day here at Ontario Legislature, where we honour the work that you do that is essential for our community. And I'm pleased that uh, Family Services Ottawa is here with us today. Uh, the work that is done by Family Service Ontario and all the agency helps end violence against women, as well as provide assistance to those with developmental disabilities. These are essential services in our communities. Coping with stress and anxiety, adjusting to separation, family service agencies have programs that help children, youth, families, students, adults, both men and women, and seniors. Mr. Speaker, est-ce que le président, la ministre peut élaborer du travail important? et comment son ministère va le faire. La ministre des Services sur un commentaire. Thank you to the member for her question. The work of Family Service Ontario and their agencies touches thousands of Ontarians and helps to make the lives of the people they serve better. Several ministries in this government support FSO agencies to provide important services across the province. And through funding provided by my ministry, FSO provides counselling and therapy for survivors of sexual abuse and family violence. They work to keep women and children safe from domestic violence through early intervention and by providing prevention counseling services for men. FSO also provides community participation, caregiver respite services and supports, and case management services for children and adults who have a developmental disability. I Answer. want to thank FSO for the hard work they do each and every day to support some of Ontario's most vulnerable. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Madam Thank you, Minister, to acknowledge the essential service that's done in our community to support uh, uh, so well. Continuing to make significant investment to support some of our most vulnerable individuals. I understand there's a one million uh, rural reality fund that is designed to help rural, remote, and northern women shelters and agencies to address their particular concern. I also understand that there's another fund of $1.5 million to increase investment to Indigenous uh, uh, community services designed and delivered by Indigenous people, including a counselling helpline for Indigenous women. Minister, can, Mr. President, can the minister please provide us with an update on the conjoint counselling program Question. that she has supported? Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as part of our government's ongoing efforts to end violence against women, for the past two years, my ministry has been testing a pilot project with Family Service Ontario to provide joint counselling programs for couples experiencing situational couple violence. This project is exploring the effectiveness of joint counselling for lower-risk situational couple violence and whether early intervention would lead to a reduction in domestic violence. The pilot is part of our government's work aimed at reducing the thinking, behaviours and conflict that may lead to domestic violence. And we've been pleased with the results of the pilot so far, which is why I'm pleased also to let this House know that we will be continuing the conjoint counselling program for another year in order to evaluate how this type of counselling is working Answer. as an early intervention to violence. I'd like to thank FSO for being here today. Your work makes a real difference in the lives of thousands of Ontarians every thank day. You. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. New question, the member from Middlesex, London. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. 
Speaker, today I'm introducing a bill to protect the conscious rights of health care professionals. Yeah. Unfortunately, this government voted down every amendment the PC party put forward to protect their conscious rights. Balance is needed in the system. The self-referral system proposed by this government, which our party does support, is only half the solution. Protection of conscious rights of health care pro healthcare professionals is the other half. Speaker, will this government support my private member's bill to be debated on May 18th? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think as uh, members of the legislature are already aware that the government's proposed legislation uh, will support uh, specific aspects of the implementation of medical assistance in dying by uh, providing more protection and greater clarity for patients, their families, and their health care providers. I have many times stood in this legislature and asserting my commitment to and respect for conscience rights of health care providers of all of us, Mr. Speaker. I've also spoken about the necessity and the imperative to assure a balanced approach that also respects patients, Ontario's Ontarians' right to access uh, medical services in this province, Mr. Speaker. The, um, it's important uh, that uh, Ontarians understand there is nothing in this legislation that would <laughs> negatively impact conscience rights of health care providers. Yes, it speaks to issues uh, that are important with regards to protection from liability and certain life assurance uh, standards and protections Thank you. and other uh, details, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Speaker. That is specifically why I'm asking for this bill. There is nothing to protect Here the is. conscious rights of our health care professionals. Exactly. Yeah. Our amendments put forward to this government was going to enshrine that legislation. This government voted it down. Many patients, many health care professionals have written thousands of letters and petitions in support of a self-referral system and protection of conscious rights. A balance is needed to ensure patients access to medical assistance in dying. Other jurisdictions have a self-referral system and protect the conscious rights of health care professionals and provide better access to medical assistance in dying than Ontario. Mr. Speaker, will the minister encourage his colleagues, sure so. the members of the government, to vote in favour of my private member's bill on May 18th? Thank you. Minister? Well, Mr. Speaker, there's no requirement by the federal legislation, Ontario legislation, to require physicians to participate in medical assistance in dying. However, we uh, we specifically, because there is an element of the federal legislation that speaks to both conscience rights as well as uh, patients' right to access medical services, we introduced not once but twice an amendment to the legislation that speaks directly to and reaffirms conscience rights of health care providers. And you know who voted it down, Mr. Speaker? That party, the Progressive Conservatives, not once but twice voted down our amendments to assert and reinforce and reiterate, as the federal legislation did, conscience rights for health care providers. Shame on you. No question, the member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. It is Mental Health Week in Ontario, and less than six months ago, Ontario's Auditor General delivered a scathing report against this government's non-record on children's mental health. She found that youth mental health agencies in Ontario have been overwhelmed by 50 per cent spike in hospitalization cases since 2009. She also found that this Liberal government had not analyzed the reasons behind the increase or taken steps to address it. Mental health issues and illnesses account for more than $6 billion in lost productivity costs every year, but this Liberal government has decided not to make mental health a priority. Why doesn't the acting Premier and this government understand that by denying mental health supports for children and youth, it compromises their ability to reach their potential in school and in the world of work and often has Question. devastating results for families in this province. Thank you. Well, uh, thank, thank you, Speaker. And I will take the first question and refer the supplementary to the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care and I this morning were at the University of Toronto, where we made a very important funding announcement to support mental health services in our post-secondary institutions, in our colleges and in our universities. Speaker, we announced 
an additional $6 million a year on top of the $9 million base funding speaker to bring to $15 million a year the supports on campus. That's a very important part of our mental health strategy to make sure that students can get access to the supports they need when and where they need those support speaker. We are moving forward on supporting mental health for children and youth, and I know the, the Minister of Answer. Children and Youth will want to speak to the supplementary. Uh, the wait lists in this province are the norm, and that's the sad truth. Ontario is facing a mental health crisis. Chimo cites wait lists of one and a half years for service. Most kids end up in a hospital only, be, only to be discharged and find that they have to wait again for services in their community. Advocates say that $118 million is needed immediately to expand treatment and make it available early. They say the system is in crisis, even if you won't acknowledge it. Between 2006 and 2016, emergency department visits by children and youth seeking help for mental health or substance abuse increased by 63 per cent. Hospitalizations were up by 67 per cent. And according to Children's Mental Health Ontario, they say, and I quote, our current mental health system is Question. not meeting the needs of children, youth, and families. Speaker, the government knew all of this and did nothing. My question is to the acting premier, why? Thank you. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'd like to thank the member uh, for the question. Um, there is um, there's no question in my mind, Mr. Speaker, that there is more that needs to be done to, uh, to help young people in this province when it comes to uh, mental health. Over the last couple of years, uh, we've worked uh, with the sector, uh, with advocates, with families, uh, with young people, uh, to look for ways to build a strategy that's going to be right for Ontario. Uh, and we've come up with the Moving on Mental Health strategy, and I uh, actually met with um, advocates this week uh, here in the Legislature, and I made a commitment uh, that we would uh, bring forward a strategy very shortly um, based on the input we received across the province and to really um, build system change that I believe is necessary in this province. Um, there, are, uh, there are areas where we see some overlap, there are areas where we see gaps. Uh, my job is to make sure that with so much change taking place in mental health here in the province of Ontario and the demand that continues to increase, I need to make sure that we're not set up for uh, change just for one or two years, but for 10, 20 years forward. Thank you. New question, the member from Davenport. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. One of our top priorities is to support our children with the best possible start in life through our publicly funded education and early year system. And as the mom of two young boys, this is a top priority for me. Investing in schools is part of building Ontario up, and it is important our government responds to the local needs while creating the best possible learning environments for students, not only in my riding of Davenport, Mr. Speaker, but across across all of Ontario. Since 2013, 146 new schools and 183 major additions and renovations have been completed to better support student achievement and well-being. I know that across the province, our government continues to invest in new Question. and renovated classrooms and school facilities. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you speak how, th how this year's 2017 budget includes key investments to ensure students are okay. learning in buildings better to support minister their of education. Thank you, Speaker. I want to say thank you so much to the member from Davenport for her question. I know how passionate she is, and indeed member. all the members, Mr. Speaker, because we believe that every child in Ontario deserves access to a world-class yes. education right. and has the right to a supportive learning environment, Mr. Speaker, so that they can yes, be their best. And that's why we're providing almost $16 billion in, in capital investments over 10 years to help build new schools in high growth areas to improve the condition of existing schools and to invest in projects to reduce surplus space. Building on our 2016 commitment to yes, increase renewal funding for schools, we're investing an additional $1.2 billion in funding for repairs and renewals over the next two years. Years in all of our schools. Thank you, Minister. We are extremely proud on this side of the House of the accomplishments and investments we have made in education. I know that last month our government also announced the details of the grants for student needs for the upcoming school year.
This is the funding we provide across boards all across the province to pr better support student achievement and well-being. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you share with this House how this funding will help ensure that the young learners in my riding of Davenport and all learners across our great province get the knowledge and skills they need for success in the modern economy? Question. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and again, thank you to the wonderful member from Davenport for her question. I know how hard she is working on behalf of her community. Last month, I was proud to announce that the total education funding will increase to $23.8 billion for 2017-18. Mr. Speaker, that is an increase of $879 million, and this includes $219 million targeted for additional teachers and education workers to support special education, $49 million over the next three years to promote and to support well-being of Ontario students, including mental health. Mr. Speaker, We know how important that is, as our Minister of Children and Youth Services has said. $66 million in funding to support our Indigenous students, Mr. Speaker, Answer. reducing class sizes, transition support to post-secondary education, Mr. Speaker, for students, and this growth in funding reflects our government's cool. commitment Thank to you. give school boards and students the best. Thank you. New question: The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you, Speaker, my question this morning is for the Minister of Energy. Uh, speaker, the Chief Financial Officer at Hydro One is leaving after receiving almost a million dollar increase in his salary last year alone now 1.7 million dollars for this position speaker now that there's another opening with hydro one will the minister who still controls 70 percent of that company or at least 70 percent of the shares of that company Will he make an effort? Will he try to get executive compensation under control chance, and Minister. start to get the millionaires out of the ratepayers' trough? At hydro. Can afford the hydro. Mm -hmm. Thank Minister you, Mr. Energy. Speaker. Once again, I'm pleased to rise to talk about what our government is doing on this side of the House to ensure that we get our, our energy and our electricity rates, Mr. Speaker, as affordable as possible, unlike the other side of the House where they have no plan, Mr. Speaker. They have no idea on what to do with energy, let alone anything to do with the province, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to being a shareholder within um, Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure the government, like any other shareholder, will of course support a plan that balances attracting the best talent to run these companies, Mr. Speaker, while at the same time getting top value for money, Mr. Speaker. We want to continue to attract top talent to Hydro One, to OPG, who can deliver value for ratepayers, Mr. Speaker. I know that's something on that side of the Answer. house that they don't understand. So over the past year, Mr. Speaker, <coughs> Hydro One has become a much better company, and its customers are beginning to see just that. Hey, hey. It sounds like the minister's ready to continue Write opening the up the bank vault and uh, allowing them to come in and take whatever they want at Hydro One. It's unbelievable to me, really, Speaker, because this government continues to put up these expensive renewables across the province that are causing chaos on our grid. Yep. They haven't stopped the Green Energy Act. They haven't stopped the sell-off of Hydro One shares. And you know, every time they stand up in this legislature, Speaker, to use Hydro One for a photo op. They remember they still own 70 percent of it, but whenever they can actually do something about compensation there, they throw their hands in the air and just say, here, come on in, take what you want. Speaker, Hydro One executives are eligible for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars of bonuses every year. Is the minister once again going to take the side of the people that are sending the hydro bills or side with the people Question. who are getting Paying these exorbitant the hydro. hydro bills in their home every month that they can't afford? Do the right thing, minister. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, on this side of the House, we're actually siding with the people of Ontario, providing them with a 25 percent reduction, Mr. Speaker. I know, I know the opposition and I know the, uh, the member opposite uh, talked about having their plan in the policy department, Mr. Speaker. Well, it's been 62 days since we've announced the Fair Hydro plan. Where's their plan, Mr. Speaker? They have no plan for hydro. They have no plan for the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to helping families, Mr. Speaker, we actually listened to what they have to say and we acted, Mr. Speaker. Yes, we put together a plan that's going to reduce their rates by 25 per cent. What did they do, Mr. Speaker? They heard and did nothing. Thank you. Oh. 
Minister of Agriculture and Point of Order. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Point of order in the uh, Public West Gallery today. Uh, we have some folks from Peterborough here for Ontario Family Service Day. Uh, Casey Reddy, the Executive Director of Community Counseling Resource Peterborough. Uh, Charlie Barton, the Chair of the Board, and Kristen Ambrose here today. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Chatham, Kent Essex, has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Transportation concerning safety, uh, student safety. This matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. We have. <laughs> We have a deferred vote on government notice of motion number nine relating to the allocation of time of uh, one, Bill 124, an act to amend residential tenancy acts 2006. Calling the members, this will be a five minute bell.
All members, please take your seats. All members, take, please take your seats. On May 2nd, 2017, Ms. Sandals moved uh, government notice of motion number nine relating to allocation of time on Bill 124. All those in favor of the motion, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Domerle. Ms. Domerle. Mr. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mrs. Jass. Mrs. Jass. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mrs. Wong. Mrs. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Rinaldi. Ms. Rinaldi. Madame De Rosier. Madame De Rosier. <laughs> All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoka. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vanton. Mr. Vanton. Mr. Denova. Mr. Denova. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 51, the nays are 40. The ayes being 51 and the nays being 40, I declare the motion carried. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.